Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 262 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renner, and the show notes are located at continuefit.com. It's where I keep all my resources, and it's where you can sign up for early notice about my book launch for Be Like the Best, a guide to reaching the top in the fitness profession. And you'll have the opportunity to pre-order the book and get some uh, great bonuses. It releases on October 18th. The book is basically 50 interviews with top fitness pros, and after each interview is what I call a be like. It's just an action step or a challenge that will help you be like the best. So go to continuefit.com to sign up. Uh, you also get five of the audio interviews that I did, and you'll have the opportunity to take advantage of the early bonuses. All right, today on the strengthcoach.com, Coach is going, I spoke to Coach Boyle about building an aerobic base working in heart rate zone two and his latest paradigm shift for the results fitness university business of fitness segment along with rachel cosgrove to talk about trial memberships should we do them and how we should do them for the functional movement system segment lee burton sat down with john Tareen at the combine they kind of talked about that value that they have with the athletes the value of the time that they have with the athletes at the combine as well as the role of the ankle in the screen, really interesting. For the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, Adam Doughty talks to Tim Robinson about where we belong and really kind of where we fit in uh, to this whole kind of strength and conditioning and, and performance team. Don't forget, you can check out trainheroic.com to start your free 14-day trial. Let them know Anthony sent you. You'll save 10% off your first year of the Train Heroic Pro or Elite Editions. For the body Bible online.com, hit the gym of the strength coach segment. I got on John Berardi. This is a long one, guys. We did an hour interview. He is the co-founder of Precision Nutrition and as well as the Changemaker Academy. He has a new book coming out called The Changemaker. And he's on to talk about behavior change and habits uh, as, it, as it relates to nutrition. You know, this is basically all we talk about today. Talk about food logs, how to approach nutrition with middle and high school athletes. Uh, got into the subject of CBD oil, uh, just because it's been a, a pretty hot topic, as well as testosterone therapy, which has been another hot topic. So lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try it out for three days, just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day answering questions and going over stuff that uh, sometimes when we're on, you see Coach Boyle a lot on social media, but it's really quick hits. Uh, this is where... He goes deeper on the forum with this stuff. You can check that offer out at strengthcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? All right, good. You know, like I said, I mean, it's funny. Um, you and I were just talking about, you know, this idea about social media and, you know, trying to kind of take some of the conversations from social media, bring them over to strengthcoach.com if they're not already there. And it always goes a little deeper. And we've gotten a couple uh, really from social media that we've gotten on the forum. That's been great conversations. And one of them is this idea, you know, you posted um, uh, on the forum about um, the article and, and we posted the article as well um, about, um, you know, if you want to stink this winter. And it was just this idea of using track and uh, cross country to get in shape for hockey and basketball and, um, you know, running those extra miles. And, you know, uh, that was probably the most popular tweet I've actually had on Twitter ever um, with all the retweets and likes. But there is some things in there that I think some questions that are unanswered. And, and you know, Dewey Nielsen, actually, we posted a Dewey Nielsen quote, and I'm going to read it about 
um, he was talking about this idea about we're, we're kind of working, we're doing too much high intensity. And that's for, he said it was for the endurance athlete it wasn't for uh hockey players or basketball players or, or that, any of that he just said you know high intensity training does come with a giant cost to your system requiring adequate recovery and without a tuned up aerobic system you're you'll undoubtedly have trouble recovering from high stress that comes with the big efforts with greater aerobic capacity your body will recover faster allowing you to tolerate and adapt to a greater volume of stress at the end of the day no matter what training stress you're applying Volume, total workload, is what we all want to increase, but the secret sauce is how well you handle the volume, and you won't handle the volume um, from a non-existent aerobic system. Again, this, and Dewey's a high, he does do uh, high-intensity intervals. He showed, I mean, Dewey's a guy who's like at a high level, like doing, doing some mountain biking and, and running and at, at a, like a seriously high heart rate. Um, and some people were asking about, Coach, how do you build the aerobic base? And I think this is the idea that Dewey was talking about with that. So from that perspective, how do we answer? How do you answer to that? I think the one thing I, as you're reading through the quote, I started to say to myself, at what cost? Do you know what I mean? It's like, because whenever people talk to me about recovery, you know, I'm kind of like, Recovery is sort of after the fact. Let's talk about performance because that's what we're really trying to improve. We're not trying to improve recovery. And I think people keep going back to, you need the aerobic system for recovery. And I'm like, we're trying to improve performance, not recovery. I'm not, you know, not to say that I'm not worried about recovery, but it's secondary to performance. And so if I look at this and think it goes back kind of to the cross country thing, I mean, if what we're doing to develop a better aerobic system is making that person not as fast, not as explosive, not as powerful. Is that really of value? If, you know, if I say I have, I used to always joke with my hockey guys and it's an oversimplification, but it's kind of like, yeah, you know, you can be a bad player who recovers really well. That's a good idea. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, you, because, and I say this all the time over and over again, speed dominates every team sport. I don't care what team sport we're talking about. You can talk about football, you can talk about baseball, you can talk about basketball, you can talk about hockey. Speed is the dominant thing, you know, speed or power, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're thinking, so like for me, I'm going to train with speed and power as my primary emphasis. And then I'm going to think secondarily about recovery. I'm not going to train with recovery as my emphasis and think secondarily about performance. And I think that's where people get screwed up. And it's almost invariably people that are on the other side of the equation. Like I look at this and think even with someone like Dewey, you know, like you said, mountain biking, jujitsu, I mean, they're, when you've got people who aren't in the conventional team sport world, those tend to be the people that have these opinions as opposed to people that are in the conventional team sport world. And when they see the people that dominate the conventional team sport world, it is the explosive, fast, powerful athlete that dominates, which means, you know, like I look at it and think, you know, we're spending all of our time trying to get faster, trying to increase our vertical jump, trying to lower our 10 yard dash time, trying to lower our flying 10 time. Those are the things that are important to me. And then we're going to condition. And, but I'm not, I'm certainly not going to get my, my car ahead of my horse in that particular situation. Yeah. But what about even like this idea of, okay, I, I understand completely what you're saying. And, you know, I'll use my own example, you know, just from like, you know, the Crash Bees, the rowing competition, 2K. And I, I, I broke, you know, the seven minute mark last year, which was my goal and really all on some interval training. So it was, you know, doing one minute intervals, um, one day a week, a, a lot of them and, and like hard as I can and uh, like a way below my, my, the pace that, you know, which is a 145 pace is what is, would be, would help me get to se under seven minutes. So, um, I would go in the one thirties for the one minute and I would do some, some one thousands and, uh, you know, I would do around that 145 pace or a little bit below. And then I would do five hundreds at like a 140 pace. That was about what I could do. And I, I crushed my PR by like 10 seconds and it worked for me. And, and I was talking to Mike McKay and he, he was talking about a little, 
similar to what, do, you know, this is talking about with Zooey, doing these long extended 40 to 90 minute, you know, in zone one, in zone two, which I just can, I will never go on the rower for 40 minutes. It's not going to happen. Maybe a bike um, or something like that. But they also talk about, so, so what if I did this for, you know, two days a week, but I'm still going to train my speed, you know, like do my, do my sprints, my time, my tens and my plyos and my, et cetera. Um, what if I did this two times a week for a couple months, and, you know, because it's quote unquote, my off season for that competition. And then I just did it once a week while I got into my intervals. So if I just kind of kept that base, if I built it and, you know, they do talk about, uh, I guess, Malfatone, Dewey was saying, you know, the aerobic deficient syndrome, you know, being a sugar burner. Talk about this idea of like not spending so much time in this, but at least addressing it. Yeah, I I just don't I honestly don't know if you need to. It was interesting today. So I had Vinny Toluto and I were um, training our pro guys, and I said, Vinny, just have everybody lay still for a minute. I want to look at the guys with their heart rate monitors on and see. I go back to kind of the Dave Tenney thing. If your resting heart rates, you know, more in the 60s or above, then maybe you need more aerobic work. And we only had six guys, but four out of six were in the 50s, and the other two were 62. And this, obviously, you know, it wasn't morning resting heart rate, guys that had coffee, but, and we just don't do it. We never have. I mean, we've never, we have never done any sort of long, steady type work ever. I can't tell you, I mean, I'd really have to rack my brain to think, when was the last time that we even did something, you know, that would be considered 30 minutes long? And if I thought about that, but what we find, and this was one of the conversations we've had for years, like with Devin McConnell, if we look at how we warm up and how we train and how we weight train, we do probably get extended periods of time in those lower zones, but it's very unintentional. And it's never sort of this, you know, what I'd like to call this sort of boring, like you said, you can't do it, right? You can't get on the, no. No. the earth for that. And, and that's my point. No one wants to do that stuff. And I don't see anybody benefiting from it. And then I see that, like I look and say, I think there's a potential negative. I believe there's a potential negative. So it's kind of like, why would I go there? Kind of knowing what I know. And then you go back, like I always go back to that Dan Baker quote, you know, particularly with team sport athletes, most team sport practice is that, you know, whatever, zone one, zone two, moderate intensity stuff. So again, depending on what arena you're in, and this is where I think we get, you know, I'm a big, you know me, I'm a big like black and white absolute kind of guy, but you do have to start looking at context and saying for yourself, like, and I always go back like to watching my kids play. If Mark goes out and practices four times a week, either lacrosse or hockey, he probably gets an hour in one of those low zones. And because, you know, they don't do anything super high intensity and they just spend a lot of time in that kind of in-between area. So most people that we're encountering are getting that. Even and I was said, so you look at your adult clients that come in. Most of your adult clients, if they're doing anything, they're probably doing low intensity cardiovascular work. They're probably walking or getting on a stairmaster or, you know, whatever, an elliptical. And we always think what they're not getting is the high end. And all of a sudden everybody's worried. And I had, I can't remember where we talked about this before, but I'm like, everybody's worried about too much of the high end. And I'm kind of looking at it saying, who are they watching? I don't see anybody that I deal with where I'm worried about too much of the high end. Oh, they're doing too many interval workouts. And I think sometimes it's almost looking at people like working out as their life. And all they do is hit stuff. I'm like, okay, that, that's not me. That's not my world. My world is athletes or general population. My world is not, you know, uh, you know, this CrossFit person or something, you know, who's in there every day, you know, or somebody who's trying to crush, you know, a super hard, whatever, a spin class or something. I don't know. It's just, I just feel like most people don't really look at the context of what they're talking about. Yeah. And yeah. say, wait a second, it, does this even matter? I, you know, it's funny because I posted on, you know, that thread I showed, I, you know, because my question was, I'm never going to get on the ERG for 40 minutes. It's just not going to happen, like I just said. But I do put on a backpack, my Go Ruck pack with 30 to 40 pounds, and I go up to 
the place and I walked the dog, right? And I had my heart rate monitor on the other day. It was 47 minutes. I was walking my dog. Most of my time was in zone two because, you know, I would pick it up a little bit. I was trying. I was, like, specifically trying to do zone two, right? You know, obviously, zone one's not easy. Big deal. Um, If I don't have a pack on, I just walk the dog for a half hour, 40 minutes. So I did three miles, and I was in zone two. So my question was, and, and Mike McKay's answer was, you know, he thought you had to have some local muscular endurance. So just walking the dog or, you know, riding a bike wouldn't help. And I kind of find that hard to believe. I, I get it. I, I still get it. But um, I find it hard to believe because it, we are talking about the heart here. Right. So the heart doesn't know what the uh, what what muscles we're using. Right. Just pump them some blood. But also. What about a hockey player? And I said this on the thread. I am not kidding around. Like, what do you expect them to do? Go to a a, a public session, and you know, because they're never gonna just skate around for forty minutes, you know, at that zone two level. Maybe in practice they'll get some. I think the practice would be more like intervals. But what are your thoughts on that idea? Like getting it through other ways. Well, I I think one like you said. I think again, people get crossed up. Like all of a sudden they say, oh, you need the local muscle endurance. Well, wait a second. As you said, do you? And I do believe there is specificity, yes. But local muscle endurance, like you're saying, 2,000 meters, seven minutes. Yeah. So is that, you know, what's the limiting factor going to be? And they're like, well, the limiting factor is going to be your aerobic capability. I mean, one, there's a, I, I'm a firm believer. There is a massive specificity of training thing that people miss out on. And when you start looking at the bioenergetics of the game, the number one thing you can do is figure out what's going to happen in the game and train to try to do that. And we've spent way too much time, and it's kind of like we always have like the special interest group. Whether, you know, for a long time in conditioning, the special interest group was the endurance athletes. And that was why we had, you know, Monarch bikes and Max VO2 tests and all this other stuff that we were doing because the endurance community was telling us that was important because it was important to them. And then the other side of special interest group is the powerlifting or the Olympic lifting people. And those are the people who are telling us that. Max strength is really, really important and we should be doing that. Or power, you know, is really, really important and we should be doing that. Instead of people looking and saying, wait a second, contextually speaking, what do I need to be able to do? Like I look at ice hockey and think I need to be able to do a couple things beyond like if I take the skill aspect of ice hockey out, I need to be able to tolerate collisions at very, very high rates of speed. Fastest sport on, fastest sport in existence. No one... No one moves faster. No one collides at faster speeds. So strength, and I used to go back to the idea when people say, oh, hockey players don't need upper body strength. I'm like, that's insane. Absolutely, positively, they need upper body strength because they have to survive 20 plus mile an hour collisions with other people moving at 20 plus miles an hour and or inanimate objects. And they need to be able to generate that speed to be able to go fast. Those are the things that are important. Then they need to be able to do that for somewhere between 45 and 55 seconds at a time and be able to repeat that. And, you know, people said, oh, they need the aerobic space, you know, for recovery. I'm like, do they really, when you look at it, like you look at a high level, you know, I always, I've given this example a million times, NHL game, you get a 20 minute period that takes probably more like 35 minutes, 40 minutes to play. You play, generally speaking, I, I don't know how many, you know, let's just say, uh, I think the average number of shifts is something like, you know, 16 to 18 or something a game. So you're going to do five 45 second sprints in a half hour. I'd look and think from a training standpoint, let's train to do five 45 second sprints in a half hour at a really, really high intensity. And let's not worry about recovering from that task. Let's make that secondary. And I think that's where we get into a problem is I think people want, to make what they do or what they feel or what they think important. And as a result, I think they don't worry enough about sort of the common sense parts of this. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. I think people get confused with you. I think you need to change. Maybe it's a little semantics because you'll say specificity. You'll say there is no such thing as sports specific training, but then you'll say specificity. Right. So I think right. people get confused. With that. Say the one area where there is specificity is conditioning. Yeah. There absolutely is sports specific conditioning without question. You know, when you look at the difference between, you know, American football, that's where you get like Tony Hall is really pushing that whole feed the cats football idea. And 
you know, the idea that, okay, you don't need, you know, people looking at like, you know, there was the video of guys crawling around the other day for 20 minutes. And you think now we've got another game that's basically, uh, I'd say somewhere between five and seven seconds on and 40 seconds off. It's like, okay, how am I going to train for that? Okay. Let's think about five to seven seconds on and about 40 seconds off. As opposed to, you know, this energy system model where you think, oh, we need this. And, you know, it's got to be, this is a lactic and this is lactic. I always tell people, I need a freaking chart to remember which one's which in all these things anyway. Hmm. Because I've become such a a believer in look at the game, train for the game. Don't worry about, don't tell me about, oh, you need to do this for recovery. Because I don't know if there's any really solid evidence out there that that's even true. Good stuff. Coach, let's segue that really quick into, you wrote a forum thread, Paradigm Shift, just talking about, is it really, Matt Sinus also wrote a, um, it was from a Matt Matt's tweet. Um, and you had, you had even said in this, if I was designing a weight room, my number one priority would be sprint space. I'd make the room as long and narrow as I could. And you know, what's funny is, I think there, you know, you had said, uh, if you're spending an inordinate amount of time teaching back squats, I think that time is wasted. Obviously, we know your your thoughts on back squats. This idea about, you know, moving more towards that's more important, right, than maybe, obviously, the weights for the speed. Um, I do want to go, I just, I want to go back to this Olympic lifting idea. I mean, do you think people are spending more time on back squats than they are, than they are on Olympic lifting? Olympic lifting, you know, the just teaching that takes a lot longer than teaching a back squat. I'm not advocating back squats. I don't do them. Yeah, but. no, I guess that was just an example. Yeah. I, that, so. Because you hate back squats. That's why it was an example. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I just, it was just using that sort of as an illustration. And it's, it's, like I said, I think the biggest thing too, with a lot of, particularly with some of the, the, the like the, the social media stuff is it's just more to, to make people think, okay, let's think about this a little bit. And uh, as opposed to, I I think we do way too much uh, repeating what other people say without a lot of thought. You know, obviously you look like I've always gone back to like the Simon Sinek stuff. Start with why. Start asking yourself why, why am I doing what I'm doing in any particular situation? whether that's in the weight room. And like I said, with the speed stuff, I mean, I'm really, and I can look at this and say, even if I agreed with Tony and said, you know something, I don't think you need to lift to get fast. I would still say you need to lift to prevent injury. But I might start looking at how I'm designing my lifting programs might change slightly, particularly with a higher level athlete. Because if I felt like, and I had some guys like that this summer, I had some guys get faster who really didn't do heavy squatting and heavy deadlift. They did a lot, you know, a lot of one leg squats, a lot of one leg straight leg deadlift. And, and almost, it's really weird. Like I was almost a little more worried about their upper body strength because I'm looking at these guys and these are NHL guys where I'm saying, Hey, I'm really worried about their ability to handle a collision. And I'm really worried about their speed. If their speed is getting better, do I need to evidence that by, 405 for 10 in the trap bar deadlift. Is is that really important for me? Knowing now that that they got faster, that we're getting, you know, we had Jack Eichel ran a 101 flying 10 the other day. You know, and I look at that and think, and, and we probably didn't lift as heavy this summer as we did last summer. So um, it does, and that's why I, I put that paradigm shift tweet up or um, thread up in the forum. Because I am starting to sort of, I don't know, rethink, re-examine. It's not going to change the way I'm going to train a young kid. But it might change the way I train a pro guy a little bit and realize that, okay, these speed days, these, you know, whatever, eight, nine, 10 mile per hour, a real, you know, like I called it in my presentation, real velocity-based training. All right, I'm going to do some real velocity-based lower training, lower body training with these sprints that I'm going to do. And I'm not going to worry about, you know, and then I look at people and think, you know, let's do chain back squats or band back squats. Like, man, I don't think that's getting you there. 
Yeah, good yeah. stuff. Coach, I took enough of your time. Uh, the discussions continue on the strengthcoach.com forum. So thanks for doing this, and we will talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. All right, guys, right now at Perform Better, the big summer sale, 40% off so many items. It's their biggest sale of the year. This is the time you have to take advantage of this. All right, don't forget the Perform Better Functional Training Institute Dry Needling Seminar, September 13th and 14th, and the Speaker School, September 19th through the 21st. Check it out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. All right, now it's time for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. I'm here with Rachel Cosgo. Rachel, thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me, Anthony. All right, cool. Last last week we talked about can you you know about going over just things we want to think about with the monthly semi private rates, but you know obviously we have to try to get people in to <laughs> come into our gym, and I know trial memberships are pretty really big for a while. And I'm not sure if I see them as much. I think we're seeing a little bit lately, we've been seeing a little bit more of these type of done for you marketing challenges. But, uh, you know, they were doing people were doing trial memberships for like three weeks for $99 or two weeks for whatever, you know, just kind of like a percentage off the regular price. Um, Talk to us about, should we still be doing that? Number one, is that still, a, you know, are, are you, is that something you guys are still recommending? Uh, and if we are, like, what are we offering, uh, you know, as a, a, you know, we can't offer everything that we do as, as a gym. Maybe we do, maybe we can. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So any of our marketing, we absolutely have to have some kind of a call to action. So that's really what a trial membership is, is it's a call to action. It's a, um, you know, risk-free offer. So it gives people that, uh, you know, that, that reason why they should call and get started because, you know, they can come in and they can try it out. Uh, so I, I still think it's a great marketing tool. I think, you know, definitely it's something that you should consider offering. Uh, the key with it is that it's not, I think a lot of people think, um, when they come in and say, yes, I want to do the trial membership, we go ahead and sign them up for the trial membership, where most of the people that come in to results, um, if we're currently using a trial membership in our marketing, when they come in and ask, you know, yes, I want to sign up for the trial membership, we take them through our whole strategy session and get to know them, get to know what their their hot points are, get to know why they came in and, um, you know, really listen to them. And by the end, you know, we've built that trust, we've built that relationship and, you know, the trial membership that they originally walked in for, we're at that point going to give them an incentive to instead go ahead and become a member. And so, you know, we will go ahead and, and go in for the sale at that point and say, you know, hey, we can do the trial membership. You can, you know, be here for a couple of weeks and quit. Or we can go ahead and get you started today. You sound like you're really ready to go. You know, you have your daughter's wedding coming up and you're really, you know, I would hate for you to do this and not follow through and commit to yourself. So, uh, you know, here's what I want to offer you today. If you join today, you're going to get, and, you know, in the incentive package, we give them, you know, like goodies, t-shirt, water bottle, you know, some, a package of goodies. Um, and then, you know, as far as the, uh, we'll, we'll usually waive the initiation fee. So it's usually that our initiation fee is equal to whatever the trial membership was. So they don't feel like they're losing out on anything. Um, and then we do have a 30 day guarantee. So there's really still no risk. Like they, you know, there's, yes, they're signing an annual agreement, but within that first 30 days, if they end up deciding this just isn't for me, they can still get out of the agreement. So um, with that 30 day guarantee, there's really no reason for them not to go ahead and become a member. So just think of the trial membership as more of a, a hook. You know, it's a call to action to get them to come in your door. And once they're in your door, you know, don't do them the, the disservice of not getting them to commit and, and get started because they're ready. And I think, you know, too much we lean on, okay, we'll just get you signed up for the trial membership. And then, you know, they do their three weeks and, you know, maybe they they don't totally commit and maybe we don't even, you know, they don't even follow through on the three weeks and then, you know, they can end up not finishing. So just make sure you're asking for that sale up front because most of our people that come in on the trial end up doing a membership from the get-go. 
Very cool. Well, I will say, in all fairness, you do have an amazing salesperson in Elias Scar, and <laughs> you guys have an amazing system. And I, I want I'm going to put a link up for everybody. Uh, I sat down with Elias to go through the whole thing for Strength Coach TV, and it was amazing. <laughs> everybody should check that out to see that. But Rachel, I think some of the people, the objection to what you're saying might be like, you know, and I know you've gotten this in your, in your, Hey Rach, you know, we don't have an Elias right now. And I, um, we don't have like a whole package where we can maybe offer them goodies right now. What are some of the objections that people have given you like that? You've recommended this to your, to your clients, to your businesses that you're, you're uh, consulting and, um, and how do you kind of overcome that for them, help them overcome that? Yeah, I mean, regardless of who you have doing it, whether it's you or it's one of your trainers or, you know, you can still follow a script and still ask the person to sign up. And that's all I'm saying is to ask the person to sign up, um, which anybody can do. And I think you'll be surprised. I think so many of us put, you know, put these own, um, you know, like limits on ourselves when the client's ready. Like they walked, they did the hardest thing. They walked through your door and they're ready to go. So don't not ask them, you know, just that's one thing is just go ahead and ask because you'll be surprised at how many of those people are like, Oh, I'm glad you asked because I, yes, I do want to do this and I am ready to go. And I'm, they're just looking for you to tell them what they should be doing. Um, So just don't be, you know, don't, be shy about that. Like, you know, you you might be surprised how many people would just say yes. Uh, The other objection I would say we get is because if you are, uh, you know, solo, which a lot of us, when we open our businesses, it's us, you know, we're doing everything. We're cleaning the toilets. We're, you know, doing the strategy sessions. We're training our clients. Like, how do I have time to do a free three, you know, or do a, you know, trial membership or like a free strategy session, or how do I have time to do this? Um, And so that's something that you definitely have to look at schedule wise is, you know, in your schedule, setting aside, you know, set times that maybe you do these appointments. If it's, you know, only you doing them, um, you know, that might be a part of, you know, looking at your time blocking to make sure you set aside, you know, a certain period of time. And then you fill those times with people that are coming in to work with you. So, um, you know, since they are coming in for that, it's like, it does take, it'd be easier to just put them straight into a workout, right? Like, um, they come in, you know, come, come on in, jump into the class and, you know, we'll get to know each other later. Um, and it does work best if you can have that time to really sit down with them and get to know them and listen to them. Um, the, the uh, odds of them committing to you for the long term are going to be a lot higher. Yeah, absolutely. Rach, we get a lot of questions on the site because I think there are, there's still a lot of people doing, you know, one-to-one. Uh, we, we have some therapists on there that are still, you know, obviously doing one-to-one and, and they ask, You know, should I offer a free assessment or first session free type of deal? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, again, same thing. It's, you know, it's a a hook to get people to come in. And I think it is a good idea to offer something, um, you know, so that people have that risk free, you know, I can come in and get to know you and Mm. get to, you know, get to know each other, get build trust. Um, You know, it's hard to get someone to, especially if you're trying to get them to commit to an annual membership. Uh, you know, there it's going to be hard to get them to commit to an annual membership without actually sitting down and talking to the person and getting to know them and showing them what you know and doing an assessment and, you know, showing them that you can help them. You know, I think that does set you apart from the, you know, the the boot camps and the, you know, even the Orange Theories or the, you know, all the other competition that's out there. When they come in and you actually do, you know, an assessment of them and you really take the time to get to know them and get to know their body and get to know their history. And, you know, it's like that is a differentiator because most gyms aren't doing that. So yeah. I do think it's worth doing just to set the groundwork if, you know, and then track your conversions and, uh, you know, it should be worth it if you're converting people to become members. Um, you know, if they're not converting and you're just spending a lot of time doing free assessments with no one joining, then then we got, you know, other problems that we need to take a look at. Yeah. Yeah. I think it really worked for me in terms of like when people said, hey, Ray, you know, Aunt, I got um my friend Rachel, you know, is a golfer and she is really interested in this, you know, uh, she, you know, she's thinking about doing it. And I'd be like, yeah, send her and I'll give her, you know, we'll have our, our strategy session, you know? And I did, yeah. I sent them a survey first that they filled out at home because I always thought that was a better way to do it. And I like the way Elias does it. Like he fills it out for them. It's how he builds rapport. I love that. But, mm-hmm. um, but you know, it was nice because I, I would use some points in that survey to talk about, 
you know, like to get to know them. And so that first yeah. 15 or 20 minutes was really just us sitting down talking and kind of going over, like maybe going over some golf or talking about courses or swings or, and then I did the assessment and then I took a picture of their posture, their golf posture, and then did a couple exercises and then took another picture and, the, and showed them the before and after. And they were like, I'm signing up, you know, it was so worth it to do it. And I think uh, I, that's why I always recommend that kind of thing, at least where you can kind of really get to know them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know for us, if we get you through the door, yeah, we can get you signed. You know, we're not worried about getting you signed up. So you got to be confident and yeah, you know, you can get them signed up. But I think if you sit down and listen to someone who's ready to go, um, you're going to end up getting more people signed up than if you don't offer that. Yeah. Very cool. All right, Rach. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's a question that a lot of people have been asking on the shrinkcoach.com forum. So uh, we'll talk to you next time. Well, thank you for having me. And for more information, make sure you head over to resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Hey, this is Adam. This is Tim. Welcome to the Train Heroic Data Driven Coaching segment. Let's go. Tim and I were just having a conversation, uh, not about data, but about our life experiences in coaching. Beautiful. And specifically, you know, I kind of mentioned I had two almost identical conversations yeah. um, about my career. And, you know, he and Tim had a similar experience, too. Yeah. And, you know, we realized one of the more important things that we ever had, so if you have interns where you are an intern, right. is, like, having a guiding voice to help you figure out what you really want or, like, where you really belong. Because sometimes it's hard to do. Yeah, it is. And, I mean, I think as coaches, you know, taking in these interns, we have to, you know, we're, we're coaching these folks still, right? Um, they don't have all the answers. We know that. But more importantly, we have to prepare them. Right, for just like a parent would prepare these folks for life after you know after we're gone and and you know I had a really good experience. My mentor at CU actually sat me down. I was applying a couple jobs in a couple different um, areas, football and, and strength and conditioning. And you know she sat me down and she said, "You got a lot going on. You really need to focus in on what you want. What do you want to do? Do you want to coach football? Do you want to coach strength? Right? Which one are you better suited for?" And that was a very eye-opening conversation to me because up until that point as a young buck I was just hoping to get in there and coach whatever I could but that focus really helped me grow as a coach sure and I you know I remember you know my first one was uh, when I at the end of my internship at Northwestern and I, I worked with Mike Schweiger there with basketball mm -hmm. and um, they have an awesome team by the way like just like that that crew was they had those guys tight it was, it was yeah. amazing but um, always nice to get that first yeah. experience of great culture but he, but uh, you know one day he, you know, toward the end of my internship he said Hey, have you ever considered maybe doing something more like sports science or sports mm -hmm. data science? And, you know, I think that that's a combination of a couple of things because I think he saw me struggling to try to figure out where I fit in. Like, yeah. you know, because you get, as an intern, you get kind of thrown in this collegiate environment and you, you know, I did some coaching and I had coached before that. You know, I was a little older. You know, I wasn't fresh out of college. I had done training and, and stuff like that. Right. Um, and so I, you know, I already knew I had a good grasp on exercise technique and some programming, all that stuff. And, you know, I was not as good as I thought I was, I'm sure. <laughs> but, you know, I think he just saw in me something, you know, like somebody who may not be well suited to that role, that career. Sure. Right. And yeah. I wouldn't have identified it myself because I was naive and, again, like, I, if I, oh, I can go be a coach. Yeah, your like, focus, I wanted to ask, too. Right. Okay. And so, uh, and then it happened in grad school too, and this is not the best thing to hear from one of your mentors in grad school. <laughs> but I had, you know, it was like it was like my first semester. I, I come out of class, and this this guy goes, you know, he's one of my favorite people. But he yeah. goes, hey, have you ever considered that maybe you're in the wrong field? <laughs> <laughs> not a bad thing, though. No. I think that's the point. But yeah, yeah, when you hear it, you're like, oh. I was like, what? And he just kind of like he goes, yeah, no. I mean, what I mean is, you seem like somebody who's really interested and motivated to like solve problems and get things done. Sure. And you know, it, again, I was naive to the way academia works, you know, and now looking back, I know I'm like, there's always issues with funding and trying to get sure. like actual full-time jobs and everything else. Right. But he was trying to communicate this, like this thing that he saw in me, like, hey, like you look more like you belong in the, the private sector somewhere. Yeah. That's what he said. And right. he turned out to be right. And I didn't know it at the time. I was just like, okay, like I'll take that into consideration. But right. it took me then stumbling through like, you know, a couple semesters in a lab going, oh man, this is actually really slow. You know? Right. And I think to realize that's true. Yeah. And I think the message to the coach is here, right? Is that that's not a bad thing, right? To allow different avenues for these interns. You know, of course you have a job and it's to win games and keep these athletes healthy, but you know, you're willing to open up an internship program. You gotta be willing to help these, these folks figure out what they want to do. And I think that starts the very beginning of the internship too. I mean, I know I've looked over a lot of, um, you know, uh, 
kind of qualifications for internships that are open, this, that, and the other. I've heard it on social, but, um, you know, I kind of open that thing up. Okay, so my qualifications would be, you know, I want to know if you are having attention to detail, right? I want to know if you're open to learning different training modalities, and I want you to bring energy. And I don't mean energy by slapping kids in the face and getting them ready to max on their back squat, right? But I mean, are the kids happy to be around you? Are they learning? Are, are they in a good mood? Do you elevate the energy in the room? And those are things that you can carry with you in any field, in any, you know, uh, sector in the fitness industry, private, team, you know, military. You do those things. And you got a really good base to build on. Yeah. Well, you said it because you were talking about these podcasts where you're you basically, you know, the person arguing, oh, you got to try hard. Yeah. you got to want it. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, I mean, that's kind of true. If you're going to succeed anywhere, that has right. to be true. Right? Work yeah. ethic is one that I see all the yeah. time. you got to have a killer work ethic. Well, that should be, you know, built in you. Because if it's not, you're gonna, not going to make it in, in, a, in a strength and conditioning career because it is, you know, long hours and it is not great pay. And you have to be willing to work super hard. So that's not something I even put on you know, the qualifications when I throw my internship out there. Sure. That's going to do it for us today. Go to trainhook.com, start your 14-day free trial. When you're talking to one of our representatives, be sure to tell them the Strength Coach Podcast sent you for 10% off a year, the pro or lead edition. Hey, here with John Tureen. Just finished up the first day of testing at the NFL Combine. It's always a great honor to come here and, and do this. And John, you know, one thing that even I have this question sometimes, um, even with my long history with the FMS, is what are you, in your opinion, I mean, you were in the, in the NFL for, what, probably over 15 years. What are the street coaches, are, what are they really looking for as it relates specifically to the FMS at the combine? You're not really looking at, you're not really evaluating players with it, right? I mean, but what, what kind of insight does that give you? Yeah, I think one thing's Lee, specifically to the FMS, um, that's actually a really huge advantage that most guys will tell you is you get the opportunity to spend eight to 10 minutes with a guy one on one, which is like gold at the combine. I mean, these guys are pulled 24 hours a day and 2,000 different directions. Nobody gets eight to 10 minutes of that kind of time with them. Uh, I'm not saying you can get to know their life history or anything, but certainly you can get a feel for them, how they respond to something new that they might not have done, how they respond to the whole process. And so you're learning a lot from them just by being with them for eight to 10 minutes. Now we're putting them through a movement screen. We already know what we're looking for with the movement screen. We know about pain and we know about uh, dysfunction. So when we start seeing some things like that, uh, we can make our extra notes. Most of strength coaches that'll come to the combine have met with their people um, back home prior to coming to the combine and know the guys that they're maybe more interested in or less interested in. And they can certainly um, ask them a few more things there. They can get a look at their, their movement. And uh, you'll remember a lot of things from that. Um, going through the screen is what it is. We know what the numbers tell us. Now, that, that, that is pretty interesting. Some, again, things that you don't necessarily think about, just that interaction. And I think um, a lot of us who do screenings get that. You, 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 you get to know and get to learn a little bit more other than just the movement piece. Um, you know, you're talking about the psychological aspect, and, you know, learning, you know, how well do they pick up some things that you tell them? Um, all those are, are good little nuggets to, to think about. So one of the things also, John, we've been doing, uh, you and I specifically over the last four or five years is, is doing a lot of ankle mobility testing here at the Combine. And, you know, looking at the research, and there's a lot of research out there saying that the ankle, uh, looking at ankle mobility is very, very important relating to injuries, asymmetries, and obviously how it affects the entire kinetic chain and movement. Um, and with FMS, we've landed in a really good spot with the um, loaded closed chain ankle mobility test is now part of our FCS as well as our motor control screen. And really one of the places that we're able to get to that point was what you and I've been doing the last probably four or five years, and that's going through different variations of ankle testing. You know, research and development, so to speak, looking at the data. We knew we needed to test the ankle. Um, we, we did it here. You know, shoot, John, you and I probably tested over a thousand ankles, I think, over the last few years, um, trying different variations in what the and what that data was telling us um, allowed us to continue to improve and continue to get to a point where I think we finally got to a good one. One thing that that I noticed uh, in doing this, going through this process, is we're talking about the ankle, but in doing some of the testing we did, and I'm going to get you to speak to this too, John, is 
it, it really dawned on me a few years ago that, you know, we're also testing the foot. And you get some of these athletes, um, specifically some of these bigger athletes and, and just really high-level athletes, uh, for that matter, have a lot of um, lack of mobility in their foot. And if they've got a lack of mobility in their foot, some of the ways we were testing the ankle, it really that really showed through. Um, so I think that, you know, that's one thing with the way we position you looking at your ankle, we're actually getting a lot of that. Um, we're checking that foot mobility as well, because if you've got a lack of mobility and, and can't really get into that supinated foot position that we know we need to get into to allow that knee to track a little bit more over the, the outside of the, the foot um, when you're going down to squatting and lunging. If you can't get that foot in what's also called a short foot position because you got that lack of mobility, it's going to create ankle problems too. So, you know, just think of, thinking about that, and, and that's something that I really noticed. And so, John, what are some of the things you saw as we went through this process? Yeah, i tell you this. From where we are now, I love where we landed on uh, how we look at ankles now, the way we, we, we go into that tandem foot position loaded and how we can simply screen out that ankle. We know the way the ankle talks to the hips, the hips talk to the ankle up and down the chain. And so um, the ankle can't be stressed enough. One thing that was really interesting, you remember this, Lee, when we, when we were doing our R&D on on different ways to look at ankles so everybody can test it. One of the things when we were down on half kneeling and looking at all different things, and one of the things when we stood them up we noticed was um, specific to this group here. When you had a receiver and you asked them to stand up and bend, they bent down like a receiver. When you asked a DB to do the ankle, they bent like a DB. An old lineman bent like an old lineman. The funny part of that is it didn't matter what they did with their upper body. We, we still were able to capture those ankles. It was just, it was like their occupation told them which way to bend. And the ankle wasn't necessarily affected by the, the so-called skill of where their upper body was supposed to be. It was just kind of interesting anecdote to notice their, their, uh, I hate to use the word muscle memory, but where their neural pathway took them to their position um, and that. But going from what we tried to look at, we saw a lot of different types of collapsing, whether it was from the foot or, or, or valgus collapse and how we were trying to look at it. And just, we never felt good about it, if you remember. We, we, we like some things we saw. doesn't mean a half kneeling ankle isn't a good test. It's the way we were looking at it. We didn't feel great until we actually stood them up got them to get to this tandem which took care of any type of hip involvement if you will in this ankle test so um i do remember that distinctly that we were laughing about that and then you know things from the shoe being on shoe being off how you screen it with the shoe on where we are now why that's a screen versus uh, a more diagnostic if you will of shoe off um and how that affects things and uh, as you mentioned the 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 foot is incredible. Now, if you went by the look of an athlete's foot, uh, the worse looking the foot, the more they're likely to go in the Hall of Fame. But that doesn't have anything to do with um, short foot and, and mobility, as you mentioned before. So those are some of the things that I think we saw. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely been interesting, been, been really great to be a part of, uh, of, of the combine the last few years. And, and it's really given us opportunity to look at the data, track some different things. Again, interaction with the strength coaches has been great. Another uh, another couple of days of just uh, getting in there and getting it done. So uh, thanks, John, for the time. Thank you. All right, now it's time for the Body by Boyle online Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment. Remember, become an insider to Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning with staff meetings, in-services, and complete access to the MBSC programs. All right, today I got my old friend John Berardi on. John is no stranger to the podcast. He's best known as the co-founder of Precision Nutrition, the world's largest nutrition coaching, education, and software company. He's also the founder of the Changemaker Academy devoted to helping would-be changemakers, that's you if you're listening, you're a would-be changemaker, turn your passion for health and fitness into a powerful purpose and a wildly successful career. Over the last 15 years, he's advised Apple, Equinox, Nike, Titleist, countless pro teams and, and professional players and professional athletes, including George St. Pierre. He's also been named one of the 20 smartest coaches in the world and the 100 most influential 
People in Health and Fitness. He's got a new book. You got to check this out. It's called Changemaker. It's coming out in the fall. He's going up against Be Like the Best, so he's my rival. So I shouldn't even be having him on this show right now. We are no longer friends, but you can check that out. We're gonna actually going to do a separate podcast that we're going to talk about, like, just our books. Uh, but you can check more out at thechangemakeracademy.com. John, thanks for doing this. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for the awesome introduction, too. I, uh, you know, we were just talking before we started recording. Uh, we we were having some conversations before our books got started. And now here we are a couple years later, a couple more gray hairs each uh, with the books out now. But it's great to spend some time together and talk about all things, health, fitness, career, nutrition. Let's do it. Absolutely. And it's funny. Uh, I'll tell everybody a little insight. John emailed me. It was like, hey, Aunt, you know, uh, want to talk about maybe coming on the podcast and, um, you know, listen, I know if you're busy and you don't have room. I was like, what, John? You could be on this show every episode. We got the John Berardi <laughs> segment. We've got to start soon. I took a screenshot of that. I was going to share it on Facebook because I thought it was so awesome. You got to do it. Do it. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I always love having you on. And, you know, some of this stuff, for you, I was like, man, I, I don't want to bore John with like some of the same old questions. But sometimes, you know, obviously with nutrition, especially performance, well, all nutrition, there's always, uh, you know, research is, is coming, new research is coming out. And I know mm -hmm. you're always up on top of that. And so some of the questions will be the same old questions. But I do want to before we do that, I want to start out with some of this idea about behavior change. You're one of the first people or, you know, that we're talking about nutrition. <clears throat> Actually, you are the first person in my book that was talking about not just macros, but about behavior change. And I wanted to ask you, one of the things that you guys talk about right away, and I remember I was listening to the Michael Gervais podcast that you were on, and you were talking about giving him an example. Like, you know, you have people, one of the first things you have people do is you talk about eating slower. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like first week and then maybe second week is, you know, trying to leave something on their plate. But what I wanted to ask you was, why, why would you do the eating slower thing first as opposed mm -hmm. to something that's measurable? Like, so if I say, John, I want you to drink half your body weight in ounces, that's really easy to kind of monitor during the day as opposed to eating slower. Just mm -hmm. talk to me about that. Yeah, it's great. And, and, you know, incidentally, that might not be the recommendation for every client okay. or athlete or person, you know, but I often use it as an example of how we build skills instead of making them uh, obedient little follow what we say machines, you know, and, and that's historically what nutrition coaching and sometimes fitness and strength coaching has been. We're like, we get a client, uh, we don't want to mess around with the uh, nebulous, uh, intangible human elements of coaching people. Uh, so we just want to hand them a plan and then have them follow it with robotic discipline. Mm -hmm. And if they're worthy, they'll follow it. And if not, they suck and they don't deserve results. And that literally has been the ethos of the industry that we grew up in. Thankfully, it, it's changing. Um, and what it's changing too is this fundamental understanding that it doesn't matter how good your plan is, if someone can't follow it, um, then it's not very good at all in the first place. You know, so the perfect plan unfollowed doesn't produce results. Uh, realizing that we have people in front of us, human beings with different life contexts. Um, an analogy that I just recently pulled from the book range. I don't know if, if you've read it, but uh, it's David Epstein's newish book and it's phenomenal. I, I, I posted about it recently on socials saying that I think it's really going to change entire, the entire society's lexicon around, we could call it like the early specialization versus early diversification of skill development. Um, you know, like, in his book, he uses Tiger Woods as an example of early specialization, right? Like you have a young person, you give them a golf club at two years old, and you make them do golf, you know, until they're an expert in winning world championships. 
Um, and in his book, he talks about that's what the media loves to attach to. But far more often, the best people in the world, the highest performers, are ones who didn't specialize early. And we know this from strength and conditioning, right? Uh, we know that generally, if you want your kid to be a hockey player, a baseball player, it's not so great starting them off at a couple years old with the baseball in hand and dragging a battery where they go. They need to develop a diversification of skills and experiences around athleticism. But even more than that, I think that's even still too direct an approach. Uh, they have to figure out what they like doing. And um, in, uh, in David's book, I think it's chapter six, he talks about this. And it's this idea that economists use of matching, right? So the idea being that uh, people who tend to be more successful in their careers have found a good match for the work that they're doing and the person that they are. So their unique abilities, their values, and, and their um, purpose. And sometimes it takes a while to get to that. So anyway, I, I think uh, what we're learning now around coaching, especially coaching nutrition, is that we have to find that kind of matching, right? We have to figure out who the person is in front of us and then give them the behaviors and the habits that'll help them feel like the work that they're doing, the nutrition work that they're doing is in alignment with their actual life. You know, not just, hey, eat these three meals at these times or these six meals at these times, but in the context of their actual life, which includes snack foods at work and restaurant meals out and special occasions and stress eating and long uh, days of work where maybe they don't get home for the normal dinner time. So, you know, the, your original question was around this idea of, you know, eating uh, till 80% full or eating slowly, which are some foundational habits that we teach. And the idea there is that we want people to build skills that allow them to be successful in eating in the context of their real life. And uh, I, I sort of visualize this as you can almost picture like a flow chart. And at the top would be your goal. Okay, so let's say your goal is get in great shape, or maybe maybe we even narrow it down to eat better. Okay. And then under that, what you have to do is figure out the skills someone would need to be successful at eating better. And then underneath each skill, you need to figure out what they would need to practice every day to do that. Now, this makes sense if you think about like, let's say learning an instrument right? Or learning a new language, right? You would never expect a different approach than this. You got to yeah. practice things every day. So you build the capacity to do them. And those practices should lead to specific skills that when stacked over time, those skills lead you to the goal, like speaking Italian fluently or playing difficult music on the piano. Yeah, when, when it comes to nutrition, we don't even think about that. Yeah. We actually just give people a meal plan or tell them to eat these meals or whatever. And we've built no skills. We've had them do no practices. And, and oh, no wonder it doesn't work out most of the time. So when it comes to your specific question, you know, the one habit or practice that we ask people to do for two weeks is to slow down their eating. Well, what does that do? Well, there's some actual tangible things. Like, for example, when you slow down your eating, you tend to eat less because you get more in tune with your uh, satiety signals during a meal. So, you know, I, I mean, it generally takes 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is for your stomach to communicate to your brain. Hey, I'm feeling full and satisfied. Uh, you can stop the drive to eat now. But I don't know about you, but I can eat a hell of a lot of food in 15 minutes if <laughs> yeah. I do it quickly, right? Yeah. So I'll Absolutely. well overeat before that signal even reaches my brain. But if I eat slowly, I tend to eat less and the signal happens and then I, I control my intake better. But even more than that, I think that daily practice for the first two weeks, let's say, and this isn't a practice forever, it's just for the first couple of weeks, helps build a, the skill of paying attention to your hunger and appetite signals. Now, I've seen a lot of funny memes on on Facebook and Instagram about you know um, intuitive eating, right? So uh, people talk about intuitive eating, and then everyone makes fun of them and saying, "Hey, well, if I follow my intuition, I'd just be eating ice cream all day," right? And the th it, it's true. Uh, the ability to eat intuitively is actually a skill. 
you don't just have it. So to be able to tune into your hunger and appetite cues, your satiety signals, you need to practice stuff. So usually this is where we begin a lot of people, but not everyone. We start with eating slowly. And that helps you pay better attention to how you're feeling during meals and the pace at which you're consuming your food and what foods you're eating. Sometimes people are like, wow, when I eat these foods, say junk foods or whatever, slowly, I actually taste the chemicals and they don't taste good anymore. But when I wolf them down, I don't notice that. Um, and then the next practice would be eating till satisfied instead of stuffed. And again, you don't have to do that forever. And for a lot of people who maybe are eating to refuel from athletic performance or a lot of people who want to build muscle, eating till satisfied instead of stuffed may not produce the results. You may not get enough calories, but we still have you work on it for two weeks so that you can, again, get really deeply in tune with you know, how your body is sending signals around food and how food tastes. So again, it's not for, not for every client. Let's say I'm working with someone who's a very high level eater. We might not need to begin there. But for a lot of people, this is just a great example. And we have a, a whole host of them of how you use daily practices to build skills, which then lead to your goal. And a, a, another analogy would be how people talk about like mindfulness nowadays. It's the buzzword, right? Like yeah. you have to be more mindful. And I think mindfulness is up on the higher level of that flow chart I talked about earlier, right? Um, telling someone to be more mindful is just wagging your finger at them. Because if they knew how to be more mindful, they probably would do it, right? So the question becomes, what daily practice can I have you do to become more mindful? That's how we develop as humans. That's how continuing education works. That's how personal development works. We need to do something that is a broken down version that helps build the skill that you want so that you can become the person you want to become. So that's how we think about everything in fitness, health, lifestyle, and nutrition. If there's a goal, how do I break that down into skills? And then how do I break those skills down into practices? And then that's what we have people do because it's the most reliable way to produce the goal that we want. Yeah, it's so true, man. It's like, you're so right. It's like, we think of that when we're, you know, with the language or with the guitar, but we, we, you know, we don't think of it with the nutrition. And, you know, I'll be honest, I think we don't think of it enough with fitness, not really with sports performance, but with our general pop clients, just to say like, hey, John, you have to, you know, you're here today, but I want you to do the stairs tomorrow. And you just say, do the stairs or go for a walk. Mm -hmm. You know, I want you to go over. I love how you give people some autonomy with your, um, can you just explain the, on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to do this habit? Mm -hmm. Talk to, just give everybody how you uh, explain, how you, uh, you yeah. get them to do things. Well, you know, uh, I was on Eric Cressy's uh, podcast, baseball development podcast earlier, and we were talking about this in the context of of young athletes and, and then professional athletes as well. And uh, I think humans are humans, right? Like, um, I'll give you a, a fun example from when our kids were young. You know, I remember when we had one child, you know, our first daughter, we have four now, and she was little and it was in winter in Canada and she didn't want to wear a coat when we were going outside. And, uh, you know, you can try and force her to put on her coat, which we did, you know, early, early days. Um, but it doesn't ever work very well. You just have this like 30 minute episode in the mudroom where <laughs> you're trying to get her to put the coat on. She doesn't want to, and you're mad and she's sad and it, it's not even going your way. And then I realized, oh, wait, but I, I'm like pretty good at coaching. Why don't I just use what I would do in that domain, which is you give people a range of choices, right? So we ended up getting her two coats, a little pink one and a little yellow one. And then before going out in the winter, we don't say put on your coat. We say, hey, buddy, guess what? Exciting news. You get to choose which coat would you like to wear, the pink one or the yellow one? And then it changes the game, right? She gets to pick like she gets to have some autonomy and even two year olds want it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Now take that up to a fully functioning, contributing member of society who has enough money to pay you to coach them, which means they've had success in some domain of their life. And you don't think they want the ability to choose also. So for us, 
coaching is a, is kind of a dance here where you and the client co-create the next few things that you're going to work on together so that they get autonomy in the choice so that they get a say and then you 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 have to figure out whether they feel confident that they can do it which is when we when we ask that question you know which generally after we co-create a series of things that we're going to work on next let's call them daily practices that are going to build the skills that that they want to have then we just ask them okay cool now let's reality test this on a scale of zero to ten uh ten being of course i can do that a trained monkey can do that and zero being there's no way in hell i'll ever be able to do that how confident are you you can do this every day for the next two weeks let's say and let them rate it, you know? And if they give you eight, nine, or 10 out of 10, you're, you're in great shape. If they give you a five or two, then you know that it's not a good practice. And of course, it's a no brainer when I say it this way, but how many people even bother to ask? Almost no one. Yeah. No. You know, how many, you know, I'd, I'd like you to go for a 30 minute walk with your spouse uh, every night after dinner this week. That's to someone who's passionate about health and fitness, that seems like a nothing, right? Yeah. You're like, of course, that should be easy for them. But do we bother to ask? What if someone were to say two out of 10? Would you still give them that practice? If they're like, no, nah, I don't. Yeah. yeah, two out of 10. Yeah, we'll give it a try anyway. No, <laughs> we just, just told you this is a recipe that's designed to fail. So it's one of my favorite ways of figuring out as a coach, is this something that has a chance of working. And it's so simple. Um, and it's, I mean, it's such a cliche around my house. I do this with my, my wife and my children now. And so they just start giving me numbers before I even ask. <laughs> I can, I will vouch for this. I used this recently with one of my clients who wasn't getting in as many workouts. She only sees me once a week, but, um, you know, wasn't getting enough workouts in it. We started to talk. I said, well, you know, on a scale of one to ten, if you, you know how many minutes, like is thirty minutes, like how likely were are you to do something for thirty minutes a day? And she said like five or six, because normally I would have been like thirty minutes is nothing. It's nothing, on. right? Yeah, it's right? nothing to you. And, yeah, and we whittled it down to fifteen minutes. So I designed a bunch of fifteen minute workouts for her to do, and you know, over the next month, and she did a great job of you know, like that 80 to 90%, she mm -hmm. was able to do those 15. And it was so great that she was able to do that. And, you know, then we we hit a barrier because she has like a summer home she goes to. And she was having a problem, you know, because she has grandkids. And so we had to like figure out like on a scale of one to how likely are you to wake up at 530 because the kids wake up at six, mm -hmm. you know, and so she was able to wake up a little bit earlier. She figured out like, yeah, I can do that. I can definitely do that. So we got her to get a little bit of a workout in before the kids work out. So I'm telling you people, this works and, you know, not to jump ahead to the change maker idea and, and helping people become successful, but you know, this is how you become successful. You have to get results too. It's not just you have a great program. Are they going to do what you say? And they have to be part of that. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a certain point in your career when you're young and you're a little bit insecure about your knowledge where writing a great program is like really, really important to you. Um, but uh, that only lasts for about a minute. And then after that, what becomes really important to you is helping the people who are paying you their hard earned dollars. It becomes a really boring career if you're handing out wonderful prescriptions that no one ever does. Yeah. In fact, you won't be doing this uh, yeah. if, if, that's, if that continues to happen. People will stop paying you, but even before that, you'll stop being interested and you'll wonder where your passion for this field went. And um, it went away because the reason you got into it was to help people. And somewhere along the way, you forgot that in the interest for writing the perfect program. So it, you know, it became, I mean, this was the fundamental shift that happened for me. You know, I was like, hey, I'm helping a few people get really great results. And almost everyone else, not so much. Yeah, I want to figure this out or else I, I can't stay in this field. And that's when I went down this path of learning about change psychology. And I realized, oh, my gosh. This is a solved problem, not in fitness, but in other fields. They know what to do in this scenario. Yeah. Holy shit. All I have to do is bring it over. Yeah, right. And then that that became a real cornerstone of what we did at Precision Nutrition. 
Yeah, it's amazing. Now, John, I want to, uh, something that falls along, we get a lot of questions on strengthcoach.com about this. And it's this idea about tra- food logs, right? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to see where, where this falls into what, when you guys, because this is another thing where it's like, hey, client, just, you know, you have to track your food the next three or four days, and you're going to put everything in there in the times, and there's some great apps that make it easy, but we think it's easy. We're interested in it. Where does this whole idea about food logs fall into your system, and is mm-hmm. it the same idea as, like, hey, can you do this? Or, you know, because it does seem like a lot to throw at somebody, but we're getting a lot of questions about it on training. Yeah. Well, you know, this is this is just one of the things. The idea that a food log is good or bad is the same as asking whether carbs are good or bad. It's just an oversimplification Mm -hmm. made by people who are unwilling to do deeper thinking about these kinds of issues. Um, If you thought deeply about it, you'd say, should I give my clients a food log? The question becomes, will that particular client, each individual in front of you at the time, do a food log? Well, how will you know? Will you ask them? First of all, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, right? Same thing we just went through. How likely are you to be able to do this? And if they say low, then you don't give it to them. Then it's not the right thing for them. If they say high, then that's great. You know, they can do it. Then you evaluate whether it's worth doing. Now, you know, at at Precision Nutrition, we have this year-long coaching program where we take people who are interested in changing their bodies and their food intake and their lifestyles through this very effective um lifestyle change, nutrition change program. Uh, There is a two-week block where we have people record what they ate if they feel confident that they can do it. Now, there's a couple parts that make this so important here. One is it's only a two-week block, okay? So people know it's not forever. And I think sometimes coaches make the mistake of... Uh, not realizing that their clients don't see the future, you know? So if you say, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to do a food log so I can get a sense for how you're eating. Well, you know that it's a temporary thing, but the client doesn't. And while they're going through it, they're afraid they're going to have to do this shit forever. (laughs) They don't know that it's going to end. So for us, we make it super clear. It's going to be a short couple week block of time. And then we let them know what value it's going to provide. And then, uh, again, if they feel confident they can do it, then we have them do that. And we give them options for how to do that. The old school way was a three-day food record. This is what we did when I started undergraduate. You know, you take a dietetics class. They give you three sheets of printed out paper, and you have to get a weigh scale, and you write down what you ate and how much it weighed for three representative days of the week. It sucked. It sucked then. It sucks now. <laughs> you know? Uh, now there's other apps and things like that. I mean, another option we have our clients do is just take a picture of all your meals. You know what I mean? And and that would be your food log for the week. Um, and so food log, good or bad, it depends. What does it depend on? Well, first of all, it depends on whether the person in front of you feels confident they can do it. If they don't feel confident they can do it, maybe it's not right for the food log yet. Maybe they need to build some other skills that gives them the confidence to be able to do this one day down the line. It's not saying never do it with them. It's saying that, hey, let's build something up, either their own personal confidence or some skills that they need to be able to do this. Um, And then second of all, what's the output of that? What's the outcome? Why? Why do we do it? Because we want to give people some objective insight into how they've eaten for the week. You know, it's not necessarily so we can count up their calories and see how close to their macros they are, which could be something that we're doing with higher level clients who have very specific physique goals or something. But, you know, for a lot of people, it's just an awareness tool. How did I eat this week? Because as humans, what we tend to do in these scenarios is we overcount the meals that we've done well and undercount the meals that we've done badly, if you want to say Mm -hmm. it that way, you know? So my recollection of the week was that I did pretty good. I remember breakfast on Monday was pretty great. Tuesday, I made a well-informed, smart choice at dinner. Wednesday, uh, my friends were going out drinking, but I didn't. So we remember all the little wins that we had, you know? But... We don't remember that, oh, Tuesday's lunch didn't go so great. And then it was Sarah's birthday at work and I had a piece of cake and that didn't fit with my goals. So this is what the food log gives you. It gives you some sense of objectivity. 
Now, again, before we rush into the space, well, that means it's good for everyone. That's not true either, right? A, people might not be able to do it, which would just be another failed experiment in their health and fitness journey. And this is something so critical to the approach that we developed at PN. People who come to see you for health and fitness, it's rarely their first time. There are usually people trying it again after yeah. having failed. So the last thing you need to do is give them more failure experiments, more projects that are doomed to fail. What you need to do is build up their confidence that, oh, my God, when I work with Anthony or when I work with JB, um, it was different. Like I could actually do some of the things they asked me to do, and I wasn't failing all, all over the place. And that's really part of the goal here. And oftentimes as coaches, we're like, ah, but but wouldn't it go faster? Wouldn't it be so much better if I gave them like bigger things to accomplish? And the answer is no, it, it doesn't if they can't do them. So that's really the balance that you're always trying to strive for. Can I help remove a limiting factor in a person's life that's preventing success and results? Um, and can we make sure that in the removal of that, we're building up their confidence and their capability to do these kind of things in the future. And uh, we can't sacrifice one for the other. Uh, like you said earlier, I can't give people something that I think sounds easy, but seems like cl climbing Mount Everest to them. Yeah, it's so true. And it really, I think a lot of times, and you mentioned, you kind of hit on this a little bit before when trainers are insecure it, you know, early on in their career, or they think it's all about, you know, the program, they have to have these amazing programs. And, and I think, you know, with, with giving them, sometimes we want to give them too much. You know, you talked a lot about, uh, I think on one of my shows a while back, like if you gave them three things to do, the likelihood of them doing those three things was, let's say, 33%. I forget mm -hmm. if you remember the, the, and then two things, the likelihood would be, 50%. But if you only gave them one thing to do for that week, the likelihood of them doing that was raised up to like 75%. Again, I forget the yeah. numbers, but it's, it's so much better. It is. And and again, what I always like to do is when when those little demons in your mind challenge that notion, and, and every coach has that, that moment in their life, they're like, yeah, but one thing, that's yeah. it. Come on. <laughs> You know, you just have to look for analogies and you have to look for those analogies in your own life. So in your life, let's say you're a busy coach and you have a family and you have all these things going on. And now you want to take on something unrelated to fitness because fitness is easy for you and it's not for them. So let's say you want to learn a language you don't know how to speak. OK, mm. think about how much bandwidth you have for that. You've got a couple of children, you've got your clients and you know, the erratic schedules that you need to keep as a coach. And then you've got maybe aging parents, and then you've got your house to take care of. How much bandwidth do you have for more than one thing for learning to speak Italian? Yeah. You might not even have time for one thing every day. You might only yeah. have time for one thing three days a week, you know? So that's how you have to think about your clients in this context of real life. And how will you know what their real life looks like? Well, you won't unless you ask. If you're a young coach and you don't have any children, you can't possibly know the time demands that someone with four kids like I have, um, what, the, what my life looks like, uh, unless you ask. And that's this is the magic of asking, right? You can see and peer inside other worlds, other people's realities with questions. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like you can figure out what that's like, and then you can help tailor your advice, your recommendations to that, but you will never figure it out. And I was, I was a dumbass when I was young, man. I, you know, I remember my, my first like really, really busy coaching schedule was when I was living down in Miami beach. I finished undergrad. I moved down to South beach and I was running a full-time coaching business and um, I had all kinds of successful clients who were 10, 20, 30, 40 years my senior. And I just didn't have the perspective to try and put myself into their shoes. So I would ask them to do the things that seem, it seemed like lightweight recommendations to me compared to what I did. Yeah. Um, and it just kept hitting me in the face that they weren't able to do it. And at first I just blamed them. Like, well, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I don't get it. I can work it into my life. 
well, my life was just so different from theirs. So it's, it's part of the thing. And it's part of the hard work of coaching, really, you know, you have to actually do extra work to figure out what your people are like, and how to fit your recommendations in with their lives. But and, and if you struggle with that early in your career, find a mentor who can walk you through that because um, the people who've lasted in this field are the ones who figure out how to do that well. And the beauty comes is that it gives you a lot more job satisfaction too. You're like, man, I, I'm, I'm actually helping people now, you know, so true. In, in a bigger way. So true. Yeah. When you realize uh, the impact that you're having and you, sometimes you have to remind, you know, remind yourself of that. Like you, you are, you're how you're making an impact in this field. Everybody is. And it's, this is why you got into it and mm -hmm. you got to keep, keep that on, keep on track yep. for that. And I think it's like what you said about job satisfaction. It's so true. John, you mentioned, uh, you know, this idea about, you know, okay, these clients were a little bit older than you and, you know, you can always put them in, 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 uh, put yourself in their shoes. Um, and it's funny, Nick Winkleman actually had a tweet today about one of the, the, you know, the best traits you can have as a coach is empathy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's so true. Yeah. Uh, but, and that's, that's one of those things I'll, I'll even harken back to what we talked about earlier. Right. But that's like saying, pay attention, have empathy. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay. How does one have empathy? Because if you don't have it right now, you're not going to just magically have it by someone yeah. telling you it's good. So this would be a, and this isn't a knock on Nick because I think he knows how to teach people to develop this. I, you know, yeah. he's he's a smart dude and and he gets this uh, behavior change and psychology piece uh, more than most. Um, you know, so then the question would be, how does one develop empathy? And I do the same thing. If develop empathy was the goal, what skills do you need and what daily practices would help you build it? And for me, it, it comes down to uh, questions. You know, insights don't come without questions. If you are telling people answers more than you're asking questions, then you're not doing it right as a coach. Yeah. You know, and I... I you know, I think I may have heard this from Mike Boyle like a hundred million years ago for the first time. You know, um, I'm sure he wasn't the one who said it first, but you know, the idea that um, you were given two eyes and two ears and one mouth for a reason, so yeah. that you could take in information, see and hear four times as much as you spout out your wisdom. You know, <laughs> and and I think that is a, a beautiful reminder. And the way to develop empathy, empathy comes when you can ask thoughtful questions and then use those questions to learn about the other person's life. Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, well, being a dad of four kids, I'm sure uh, they've helped shape uh, some of the things like you just talked about like go, yes. leaving the house uh, when your daughter, she went to the Wim Hof seminar probably. And she's like, I don't need a jacket. Um, <laughs> right. But um, John, uh, one of the things we just had uh, Drew Massey on our, the last episode talking about training high school athletes, but uh, we get a lot of this on the forum, the strengthcoach.com forum as well is, is, you know, how do we educate kids middle school and high school athletes about nutrition, because I think we've done it wrong for so long with just kind of like forcing information down. Mm -hmm. What's the approach with, with, you know, that age and mm -hmm. is it any different or is it just like, Hey, on a scale of one to 10, how can, you know, like how do, how yeah. do we approach this? Well, I think the, I, I think the thing that we have to begin with always is uh, do they want this information? You know what I mean? Cause if they don't, then it's doomed from the beginning. Yeah. Then there is, there's no strategy or tactic or hack to make someone who doesn't want to do something, <laughs> do it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. fundamentally. And oftentimes what we do is we have a whole value system around food and, and correct living that we try and impose on these young people that um, doesn't at all square with what they're interested in in life. So the, the beginning is... Um, why? Why do we want these kids to eat better? Do they actually need it? In some cases, the answer will be yes, and in others, no. You know, I worked with George St. Pierre for years, and before we started working together, he paid very little attention to his nutrition, and he was a world champion, you know? So <laughs> it wasn't really important to him, and you see this in elite sport all the time. Uh, these kind of details, uh, I'll call nutrition a detail. Let's call like 
movement prep, you know, rehab, prehab, you know, movement quality. Th these are all details to elite athletes until they start getting fragile, which means a little bit older, right? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, crap. Some of these younger guys are coming up and they have youth on their side. I need nutrition and movement and all this other stuff. So that's usually where it starts happening at, at elite sport, you know, and, and, but, you know, I don't want to take for granted that every young athlete needs to eat better because I don't know that that's true. Um, so that's where we begin. Why am I imposing this correct living paradigm on these young people? And maybe I could just stop. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe instead of doing that, I can say athlete X in front of me, Joe, um, athlete Y over there, Sarah. Um, what do they need most right now from a nutrition intervention? Is it weight gain? Is it weight loss? Is it energy during uh, competition? It, is it um, they're deficient in a micronutrient and that's the rate limiting factor for high performance? I have to begin from there. And then I can have a much easier conversation with Joe or Sarah about why we're going to do a nutrition intervention. And I don't have to make them change their whole diet. So let's say I have like a young high school female athlete who's an endurance runner, and she recently decided to stop eating red meat for ethical reasons or whatever, right? And now her performance is starting to suffer. Um, that's a classic telltale sign of like, let's say, iron deficiency anemia, right? Mm -hmm. So with this athlete, do I have to change all of her eating? Do I have to make her eat meat again? Or can I just give her an iron supplement? You know, this is how I think about it. This yeah. is her limiting factor was iron. So why would I need her to make 100 nutritional changes, which is essentially what you're asking someone to do if you ask them to go to paleo or do keto or do yeah. some kind of named diet? when all she needed was iron. So if I could just tell her, hey, when you removed red meat from your diet, you develop, you're developing an iron deficiency anemia, your blood can't carry oxygen similarly or deliver it to the tissues well. So we need to fix that or else your performance is gonna keep suffering. So here's a couple options for how we get iron back into your diet. It's a totally different conversation and I can give her super easy ways to do that. And the same thing happens with weight gain and same thing happens with weight loss. So. For me, when we're working with young athletes, it has to start from our own, like what's in between our own ears. And usually what coaches want is, well, how do I get something in between their ears that's different? You know, the yeah. answer is your ears have to change in between your ears. And that's what kind of place are you coming from? Is it you just want them to live correctly? You know, again, Eric and I talked about this recently um, with the subject of tobacco in professional baseball, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea that, a lot of coaches don't want their athletes smoking or chewing or whatever the case may be, mostly because of correct living reasons. It's a moral judgment. You know, I'm like, is chewing actually negatively affecting a professional baseball player's performance? Whether you think it's disgusting or not, whether it will lead to mouth cancer or not is irrelevant. Is it something that's affecting their performance? Cause you're implying it is, and they, kind of know it isn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? So really, you know, when it comes to young athletes, that's where we begin. What do they, does that particular athlete need? And how do I help them get that thing with the fewest number of interventions or steps or work on their part possible? And then here's the beauty of that. If you just give them the one thing that actually is the limiting factor, the log jam in their performance or their life right now, and it works, it fixes it. The next time you have to add another thing, they have confidence. They have confidence they can do it. And they also have confidence that, hey, last time I tried a nutrition thing, it wasn't so bad. It actually worked out pretty great. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm cool to yeah. do the next thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so you have to think of it as a long-term development model rather than a short-term fix. How do I build the kind of person who wants to eat better, who recognizes the value in eating better, and can become the kind of person who does it without much difficulty. That's a long-term development project, and it's totally different than how coaches are seeing it. They're like, how quickly can I get my football team to all eat better? Can I get it in a month? Can I get it by the end of this season? What if I teach them about protein, you know? And I think it's, I think it's going about it all wrong. You know, what about I think... 
But like you mentioned that football team though, like let's say there's 40 guys, 40, you know, 40 kids playing or, or, you know, like you go to some of these sports performance centers and there are, you know, they don't have the programs in place to work with people individually. So what do you say to that? Well, then when we do, when we do that, then we just look at the biggest things that could be in the way if, if things are in the way. So maybe you stratify your team by the kind of position that they play, say, uh, you know, I don't when I worked when I've worked with, uh, you know, professional football teams, for example, you know, your linemen, sometimes your linebackers, they have to make a certain weight, the coach sets a weight for them, whether we like that or not, it happens, right. So when then with them, you're like, okay, cool, these are some individuals who need to figure out how to make weight. And then we, so you can stratify your team by goal, right? Mm, yeah. And then you can work with them on the few things that help that kind of person make weight for camp or whatever the case may be. Um, so you can stratify by goal, or you can look at the team as a whole and say, what are the things that they're likely to be deficient in? It's for high school athletes, it may be protein. It may be hydration. You know, so you pick three or four things and you say, okay, which one is holding them back the most right now? And then you work on that one thing as a team, you know, and you make it really simple. Like, Let's say hydration is the big issue for a particular team during a really hot training season. Great. Can you give them all a team water bottle and give them, you know, an instruction for how much they need to drink uh, by the end of a day? And can you shape the path for them easily that way? You know, so it's how easy can we make it for the person? Here's here's an analogy I often like to use. You know, I um like if if I get a hole in my roof or my roof starts leaking every time it rains, the roof starts dripping. Um, do I want to uh, someone to come in and teach me how to do roofing so I can fix the roof myself? Or do I want someone to just come and fix the roof? You know, <laughs> uh, generally, our approach as coaches has been to teach people roofing. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And <laughs> That's silly, right? Again, analogies I think are so useful and uh, and in in range, which I mentioned earlier, it just reminds me he writes about this. Some of the best thinkers actually do analogies all day long. That's how they arrive at discoveries and conclusions. You know, like what am I doing in my professional life? Are there any analogies for that in other spaces in my life? Right. And this yeah. roofing one's just a great example. I just want some, I want someone to come fix the roof. Yeah. And how can we get our young athletes or our professional athletes, the closest approximation to that with their food? Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I think a lot of coaches, especially the ones who are using FMS, it, it, like listening and we've had a couple guys like where you know how to use the fms with groups it's the same thing like okay you guys need you know mobility corrections you need stability corrections and they kind of they stratify them like you said mm -hmm. buckets and say you guys are going to work on these three or four things and but we're also going to do this part of the warm-up but let's break up into our groups right now our mobility stability our deep squat group whatever it may be and that's we work it. on a few things that's good stuff. perfect see you just did it that's a great analogy yeah. and then you say okay cool how can i stratify my team by you know say food needs or nutrition needs or whatever and then we then we make it that simple you know and then and then again how how simple can you make the the mobility work or the warm up or whatever, you know, that's the next goal. Once you've stratified people, like do these kids want to spend just as much time uh, warming up as they do working out? No, <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. we know that answer. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, so how do you make it very simple for them? You know? Um, and so same thing with nutrition. It's, it's, it's how can we, um, I, you know, when we go in and work with a professional team, education is a small part of what we do. We just want to feed them, you know, like some teams we, we can feed them two out of three meals a day, which is great. Yeah. I almost don't even care what they do the third meal yeah. as long as I get the first two great for them. And then, you know, and, and how we do that is we work with the cafeteria team and then, you know, we, we have what we call super shakes ready for them after practice. So literally they have a customized shake that they are handed as they leave the practice field and then they get their other meals, you know? So once we take care of those, you know, I, it's fine how you eat outside of here, 
But then we layer in a little bit of education, but we do that in context. For example, we'll have posters around their dining area um, and we've stratified our athletes by athletes maybe who want to need to gain weight, athletes who need to lose weight, or athletes who need to maintain. And then we just sort of color code the foods that are on offering. Um, and then we'll say like proteins blue and carbs are red and vegetables are green or whatever. And we say, if you're a weight gain athlete, you have to have a couple of this number of blues, this number of reds, this number of greens. If you're a weight loss athlete, you have to have this. And if you're a weight main maintenance athlete, you have to have this. And so like they're learning you know, what are proteins, carbs, and fats this way, rather than just through words, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and, and again, like for a high school football team without a budget, this isn't the solution, but it's where I begin. This is where we say, okay, this is ideal. How can we make it as close to that as possible on a small budget? Yeah, I love it. I love that approach. Good job. Um, John, let's let's go into some more details of um, something that's been kind of all the rage lately. And a lot of coaches, I actually know a coach who was supposedly fired for recommending some of his pro players um, CBD oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of been all the rage. And, and I, every, like every gym owner is selling it now. Um, there's so many different um brands and there's a lot of claims from whether it's joint health or better sleep to reducing symptoms of menopause mm -hmm. um, can you talk to me about your what you've found right now in your research on cbd oil mm -hmm. yeah for happy, performance athletes yeah happy to um but before we do that um i'm going to ask you like do you anthony do you take vanadyl sulfate uh, not that I know of. Okay. Do you know what that is? I do not. Okay. So back in the uh, early nineties, um, that was a miracle supplement. Okay. Vanilla sulfate is a trace mineral that's supposed to help with glucose disposal. And so it was marketed. It was probably the number one supplement before creatine even, um, that if you were a working out athlete, you're supposed to take it. And it's supposed to drive glucose into your muscles and give you amazing pumps and shift your nutrient partitioning from, uh, you know, glucose being turned into fatty acids through the liver. And, you know, so essentially your carbs don't turn into fat, but they become muscle, right? Okay. And I'm oversimplifying, but obviously, you know, this is some of the claims, right? So... No, probably 90% of the people listening aren't old enough to remember how huge vanadyl sulfate was and how big it was supposed to be because it was just a fat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and you and I could name dozens more since then. So um, am I saying CBD and cannabis are a fad? Uh, kind of, but not. I'm saying there are legitimate uses for them. However, there is no way they're as good as they're being claimed to be right now. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. There's, there's just simply no way. Remember when fish oil was going to cure everything? Yep. And now we know, hey, you have to use it in certain circumstances and cautiously. Everything, everything is this way. You know, it's the like... The reason that people feel the way they do about CBD right now is because it's new and we're all excited by new, including me, um, because there's a huge marketing engine behind pushing it. So it's in our faces dozens of times a day. So psychologically, we think, well, because everyone's talking about it, it must be great. But this is how every fad, it, it's just the fad engine. It's just X, you know, what is the hot thing of the day? It's X. It's vanadyl yeah. sulfate, it's creatine, it's fish oil, it's CBD. There's going to be something tomorrow. Like there'll be a time in the next few years where people will forget how hot everyone was on CBD. It'll just be another thing that's potentially offers benefit or value, you know? So, I mean, number one, it's, it's not as good as everyone was is saying because it yeah. can't possibly, can't possibly live up to that standard. Um, but I, I remember I remember my first sort of uh, exposure to this in sport. I remember working, um, or it was like really early in my career, and I remember working with some elite strength and power athletes, 
And these guys would never admit this to most of their coaches and stuff, but I got to know them well. And I was delving into nutrition and lifestyle and they were telling me they were using uh, cannabis. They were smoking marijuana, you know, um, after hard training sessions. And, um, you know, even back then, you know, I was like, Oh, a gas, this can't be good. You know what I mean? (laughs) Drugs, drugs are bad. Right. Um, and after I started talking to more of them and really trying to unpack this, you know, rather than just judging it, uh, I started to realize, Oh, there, there might be some mechanisms here. Originally I thought it was okay. So imagine you have strength and power athletes who uh, are wired to be sympathetically dominant. Their sympathetic nervous system is dominant. That's why they're so good at Mm -hmm. what they do. Um, How are they getting parasympathetic recovery? Are they going for a nice, uh, sunset walk, you know, are they having candlelit baths, you know, are they doing deep <laughs> breathing and listening to Kenny G to activate their parasympathetic nervous system? No, these are often NFL players, you know, who come from challenged socioeconomic places. Uh, they're not doing this kind of stuff, you know, so this might be their only way to activate their parasympathetic nervous system to have some cannabis and play some video games and go to bed after a big sympathetic nervous system or central nervous system workout. Um, And then, you know, all the research started up again. And now we're seeing like, oh, yeah, there's inflammation and there's nervous system and there's, there's all these effects. So, you know, what I've often said is, I think that activating your parasympathetic nervous system when you're a sympathetic dominant athlete is really important to recovery. There are lots of ways to do it. You don't have to use CBD. You can. Um, you can do other things. So I work with our athletes on that. How do we activate the parasympathetic nervous system um, in different ways? You know. Um, so for for my part, uh, again, I, I'll never forget like the first feeling of being like, oh, that that can't be helpful to you, like yeah. to just smoke weed after sprint day. You know what I mean? But then really kind of going, but so many of you are doing it. Is this just the way the culture of this sport works? Or is this the only way you guys can unwind and actually get to bed? Well, wait, yeah, some of you don't sleep after hard training nights without this. Oh, all right, cool. Are there other ways to help you sleep? Uh, can you do this a couple times a week and it be effective, helpful? You know, so I, I think there's I think there's something to be said for CBD. And let's let's even call this out. Nowadays, people are saying CBD to be safe because they're still value judging against THC because yeah. that's what makes you high. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. high is bad, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think THC has a whole host of benefits in certain circumstances as well. I'm not prescribing it, and I'm not certainly saying young people go out and do it. But what I'm saying is that if we're going to talk about cannabis, let's talk about the whole thing. Because just like everything else, there's like when you get the the, the stuff that was in the plant, you know what I mean? You get the whole range of benefits. It's yeah. like taking vitamin A versus eating a vitamin A rich food. And, um, and let's, let's, let's look at this thing objectively, uh, rather than just value judgments against it. You know, I live in Canada, and it's totally legal now. Like, yeah, uh, people in the States are sometimes shocked. But I'm like, I can literally walk into a store that's in my town. It's about two minutes away from my kid's school. And it it looks like the Apple store. It's as nice as the Apple store. Wow. And I can walk in and buy any kinds of cannabis products that I want and walk out. I can also order them and Canada Post delivers them to my house if I want. Wow. So, I mean, it's that sort of normalized up here in Canada and, uh, and Not surprisingly, loads of progressive research is being done showing like what the actual risks are and what the actual benefits are. So, you know, I think if people are wanting to explore this stuff, obviously, like every other supplement or product out there in the world, some are made badly and some are made well. You know, some CBD products contain the amount of CBD that it says on the label and others don't. Some contain other things that come with the CBD. Um, Others don't. You know, so it's a buyer beware scenario out there. You know, if you are going to use it, make sure you do your research about why you want to use it. 
And then make sure you're choosing a company that can show you that what they say is on the label is actually in it. And, and a lot of companies have to. This is another great part about how Canada is doing things now is that they all have to be tested and independently verified so they can't sell anything that's not what it says it is you know yeah yeah it's good stuff well you know the title for this uh for this podcast now i'm gonna be big berardi said we could smoke weed. So, <laughs> that's right um, i gotta use it although um, <laughs> smoking is the one way i'd say don't do it right yeah like yeah. uh nowadays you know they have vaporizers which is mm -hmm. like people don't know the difference but vaporizers turn like when you smoke pot, like like many people did in high school, you you combust the herb, right? So you mm -hmm. light it on fire and then you smoke the fire from it. Vaporizing is totally different. It looks the same. It looks like a cloud of smoke, but what you're actually doing is like um, you're you're causing it to the the active components turn into like a vapor. So you're heating it to a much uh, lower temperature. And it's a totally different effect on lung health and, and all these other things. So it's, it's, you know, again, it's, Barati didn't say smoke, like smoke it. Yeah. <laughs> he said vaporize. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, John, in the last, like, I know it's hard, but we've been on almost an hour. The last three minutes, uh, another thing that's been kind of all the rage has been kind of the testosterone therapy and everybody's low T and it's becoming, uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions from my clients and, uh, we see it, we've seen it on traincoach.com. Uh, I, you had a great response to Michael Gervais about using this. Cause you know, we're, we're, I'm 52. You are 50. No, 40, uh, 45. I am. Okay. 45. Yeah. So you're, you're approaching that age, uh, where the testosterone is decreasing. Actually, yes. we're, we're both way past that. So, <laughs> um, but just give us your take on this idea now too, because this is another thing that is just seems to be everywhere and we have to take this and we're losing it and you need to do this. Yeah. I mean, anyone who knows me knows I, I question everything. When people yeah. start lining up and ascribing to a particular philosophy or belief system, I go, Oi, okay, well, what's bad about that though? And so, you know, when I, when I got to thinking about the testosterone thing and it, it does, it becomes, it becomes sort of like a movement in health and fitness. Guys tell me like the minute I turn 35, I'm going to go have my testosterone checked. And if it's low, I'm going to get some replacement tea, you know? <laughs> And, um, and it just becomes like what everyone does. And when that starts happening, like the flag goes up for me, I go, it can't possibly be good for every single 35 year old whose tea is starting to diminish, right? Like people have different mentalities and different goals in life. And like, how could it be useful for everyone to do the same thing that just feels like a bunch of sheep lining up to the slaughter. So when I started thinking more deeply about this, I started realizing, yes, if you're hypogonadal and you have clinical symptoms and like it's making you ill in a sense, then sure, you should be treated with the right medicine. But that's not how people are looking at this. You know, a lot of people are looking at this as a way to just not escape or, or to hold on to the past. You know what I mean? Like to fight against the inevitable consequences of aging. And part of aging is freaking great. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Part of getting older, I mean, yeah, maybe my joints don't feel as good as they once did, and it's a little harder to uh, put on muscle mass than when I was younger. But man, between my ears, life is way better, you know? Um, like, I'm much more calm and patient, and I'm not competing with everyone over everything anymore. And uh, this, these things make me a better parent, and they make me a better advisor. And so I started wondering, you know, is there an advantage to declining hormonal levels as long as you're not getting sick from it as you get older. And I think there actually is. I'm not going to say there's an evolutionary advantage or anything like that. But the kind of person I'm trying to become as I get older is a, a, a wise elder, someone who young people can come to for some wisdom and to avoid some of the mistakes I might have made when I was younger. And I'm way better at that if I'm not high testosterone. Uh, I'm probably not better at it if I'm hypogonadal. But, you know, letting nature take its course and keeping a great lifestyle during that time, I don't know, part of me questions the ethic that we need to keep our hormone levels to what they were when they were young. 
And again, like lots of people are financially incentivized to convince you otherwise, you know, anti-aging docs and hormone replacement clinics and all of them are financially incentivized to convince you that it's bad to have lower hormone levels and that you ought to replace them. Well, of course, they'll try and convince you that, you know, that they make their money exclusively that way. So for me, it's just questioning that ethic and saying, like, can you make a more informed choice? You know, I talk about this with women as well, um, who are going through menopausal transition. You know, you can try and fight that by taking hormones and trying to exercise more and, you know, doing all these crazy things so that you can, I don't know, preserve the young body that you once had. Or you can just say, this is what happens when people get older. It's, it's what happens. Yeah. So if I continue to live a great lifestyle and I lean into the shifting roles and priorities in my life, I may be happier. I may have a level of acceptance and, um, and, a, and a level of comfort in the new stage that I'm approaching in my life instead of trying to make it like it was. I, I always think back... Uh, my wife, Amanda, and I, the first vacation we went on together when we were dating was an all-inclusive resort in Mexico or whatever. And I'd never been to one in my life. And it was a phenomenal experience. We loved the resort. We loved the time there together. And I remember a few years later, we tried to recreate the experience. We tried to go back to the same resort around the same time. And it it wasn't the same, right? And all things happen this way in life, right? When you try and clutch on to some imagined perfect past, it never goes very well. And you're always just disappointed and depressed about it. And this is how I see people being as they go through these hormonal shifts in their life as well. And I just think you can continue to fight against it or you can embrace it. And this isn't saying let yourself go. Obviously, I want you to eat well if you if you want that um, and live a great lifestyle. It's just do we need to be injecting ourselves with hormones when, when we're not sick because they're not there? Yeah. And so... Again, if you are sick, then I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying that it's not inevitable that you ought to want to have hormone replacement when you go through the very natural stages of aging. Yeah, I, I just I love that answer because I think again, you know, it it becomes we think it's when we hear so much of this, it's coming from us, and like you said, like might be coming from doctors who have other, uh, you know ulterior motives. Um, and it just ends up being this, Hey, I'm supposed to, I can replace this. And, and you don't th- know, you don't need to always do that. And you need to think a little bit more. So John, I, you know, geez, this has been amazing. And I knew it would be, and, uh, that's why I wanted to, uh, have a separate episode talking about change maker. Yep. And uh, and the Changemaker Academy, and and uh, because um, I knew all these topics would uh, would come up and take some time, and uh, thank you so much for coming on and and uh, imparting your wisdom, and thanks for not getting testosterone because you might have different answers. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I think I would actually, yeah. and that's that's part of what I enjoy about it and uh, about getting older. That hey, I I I think I'm allowed to have a new perspective on life, you know, and that's. And and part of that is the hormonal shift and part of it is experience and all the rest. So great conversation today, man. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. And we're just to remind everybody, we're going to get John back on. We're going to talk all about our books, The Change Maker, and um, and and uh, be like the best. And that's going to be in October, right before we both release our books. So, John, thanks again for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks to everyone who listened and have hung with us the full hour plus. I appreciate your time, and hopefully, you got some value out of our conversation today. All right, that's going to do it for episode 262 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for three days just to buck you have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best form on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. Go to strengthcoach.com to get started on your trial. Thanks to Chris Pryor and the folks over at Perform Better. Remember, big summer sale, 40% off. Take advantage of it. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and John Berardi for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strengthening, conditioning, performance enhancement, nutrition, and behavior change. Thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Head over to trainheroic.com. Start your free 14-day trial. Let them know Anthony sent you. You'll save 10% off your first year of the Train Heroic Pro or Elite Editions. Rachel 
Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Lee Burton and John Treen and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at FunctionalMovement.com. My name is Anthony Randall. Go to ContinueFit.com to get early access to Be Like the Best, a guide to reaching the top in the fitness profession. Remember, sign up. Join the list, you'll get five audio interviews from the book, and then you'll have early access notification to um, the the bonuses for the pre-launch. So check that out at continuefit.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.